Welcome, uh, Max of the Accidental Engineer here. Uh, I'm joined by Charles Martin today. Uh, decades long experience in the data science and machine learning uh, marketplace. Uh, so Charles, do you mind introducing yourself to folks? Great, well thanks for having me. I'm Charles Martin. Uh, I run a boutique consulting firm, Calculation Consulting, where we do projects for companies in machine learning, data science, and AI. I been in this field as, as Max has a long time. I was a, I did my PhD at University of Chicago in theoretical chemistry, and I was an NSF fellow in theoretical physics and chemistry at University of Illinois, where we looked at the statistical mechanics of neural networks. And since since my postdoctoral work, I've been working in the field of AI and machine learning. Awesome. Do you mind telling us a little bit about what types of gigs you've held recently? Uh, do you own a business? Do you uh, consult? Sure, sure, happy to. You know, we, we do a variety of different kinds of consulting. Um, you know, the most successful of the projects, of course, was Demand Media, which was the first billion dollar IPO since Google, where we use machine learning to essentially uh, find a way to drive traffic on Google and got them a 500% increase in revenue. We do a number of enterprise consulting firms. Last year, we did a large project with GoDaddy, um, helping them. Uh, they can't talk much about it, but essentially working in the domain name space, looking at ways of pricing domain names. Uh, currently, I'm acting as the interim CTO of a private equity fund, which is looking to develop AI technologies for trading in the markets and building a market uh, trading platform. So for people who are relatively ignorant about what the day-to-day -day of a data science consultancy engagement looks like or a data science full-time role might look like, what does the day-to-day -day look like? What we do is come in with clients and try to understand what particular problem are they trying to solve. And you know, usually it, just, it takes a couple of weeks, maybe a month or so, of looking through the data and figuring out and sort of what, what the right way is to frame the problem. Then we move through a research phase where we propose small experiments that might be done. You know, some experiment that allows us to test a hypothesis that we have. We form a hypothesis collect some data, spool up an IPython notebook on the cloud, run an experiment, try to predict something. And then we repeat that process. So it, it just sort of repeats um, every couple weeks or every month. We go through and try to figure out what can we predict using the data that we have and what is the right way to frame the experiment. For the audience that doesn't know, there's a few different areas of research and application in machine learning. Uh, there's supervised learning, there's semi-supervised learning, and there's unsupervised learning. Uh, so do you mind sharing for the audience that might not know about these topics, what those three areas are? Sure, sure. Um, when, when you're running a machine learning project, the, the most successes are when you have collected a large amount of data that you can take action on. You know something about what the users have done and you can take action on it. And you've taken some action on it, so you know how the users have responded to something. So, uh, I mean, a good example would be like with Demand Media, they had created a million web pages, and they knew how many clicks, how many views they were getting to every web page. So you knew, you know, we produce this web page, we get this many views. Uh, and so they've collected a huge amount of data. They've run a experiment where they've collected this. This allows you to then design a supervised learning experiment to ask if we create another web page, how much traffic would it get? So since you knew how much traffic you got in the past based on a million pages, you can predict what you're going to see in the future. And that's supervised learning. Unsupervised learning is a case where you have collected a huge amount of data, but you don't really have any feedback on how it's been used. You just have the data and you're looking for random patterns in the data. So you're going to run some sort of clustering algorithm, some sort of, and you're going to look at the clusters and try to figure out what the clusters mean um, and whether there's something beneficial from that. The, the hybrid of that is a semi-supervised case. So a, a good example of this is a project I worked on in finance where we're looking at clustering of SEC filings and we'd like to understand, can we cluster SEC filings, information about companies in a way that we can form a new type of company model? So we have some labels already. We know that companies live in certain categories because you know, there's some code that somebody made up and there's like a 
some category, but we'd like to, and, and we can use that to guide the algorithm to give us a much broader and richer representation of how you would describe a company. So, so the three cases are when you have lots of lots of labeled data and you're trying to predict something new based on the labels you have. That's supervised. Unsupervised, you don't have any labels at all. You just have data and you just want to search through and find patterns that are interesting. And the semi-supervised is when you have some set of labels that are sort of weak. You have a, they know a little bit of information and you're trying to make a much richer description of what you have. You shared some of the examples you've had of clients who have problems where uh, they're either supervised, semi-supervised, or unsupervised. What are the most common types of problems? It sounds like supervised? I, I would say that, I, more I would say, what are, the pro, what are the kind of clients that are the best candidates for an engagement, a machine learning engagement? So the kind of client that if you go into them and you build them an algorithm and you get it into production, you could give them a 15%. 20%, 50% increase in revenue almost immediately. As soon as you can get the thing into production, they start thinking back. What kind of client is a good candidate for that? And those kind of clients are ones who maybe they've collected a large amount of data uh, and they've been doing some very simple demographic targeting. So they know, well, when men click on this ad, we, we, they, we know that, that that's preferable to women, or we know that people of a certain age group prefer reading this document over that document. You know, they, they know something, a very broad general category, and they've been able to collect some specific feedback about, from their users or what, you know, whatever it is, the feedback of, of, of running this experiment. And now they would like to dig deeper and say, I want to do a very, very specific algorithm. I want to target an individual user, an individual viewer of a website, an individual customer, uh, or, or I'm trying to predict something like how much traffic, like in Man Media's case, they had produced huge amounts of web pages and they knew generally, you know, how much traffic they were getting in a broad sense, because you know, Google Analytics would tell them, but they didn't know at a specific level how to predict how much traffic would a very specific website, a specific web page get. So, when, so a good candidate for machine learning is when you've done already some broad level experiment, you have some feedback, and you want to go in and really squeeze out that 20%, 30%, 40% boost of revenue that you can get by looking at the very, very specifics. And, and the thing about machine learning is that it's, it's like doing statistics at scale. It's like running Excel, but you have 50 million rows. Mm -hmm. You know, it allows you to do very, very fine-tuned predictions at an individual, very, very granular, granular level. And th those are good candidates for supervised learning. Um, the unsupervised cases are much more challenging. This is a situation where maybe someone has a massive document collection and they'd like to know how to cluster the documents so they can present them to the user in some way. Sure. So and, and they don't know anything about the clusters. Like any clustering will do. And you, know, and you don't really know what is a good clustering, what is a bad clustering. You just try different algorithms, you look and see what you get. Uh, or they have some large amount of data and they're looking for some arbitrary pattern. And they don't really know what drives what. They just know, well, there must be patterns in the data. So they try to look for some pattern that maybe the pattern, you look for a pattern that appeared six months ago and you see whether it appears this month. Makes sense. Many of our audience may be in graduate programs, whether masters or PhD. You have a background in a PhD in chemistry, moving from academia to the private sector. Uh, I think a lot of people are curious about uh, how you made that change. I realize it's not contemporary necessarily to this job market uh, or the current market demand, but maybe tell a little bit about how sure. you made the switch sure. over from uh, choosing not to continue in academia after finishing your PhD. You know, when you do a PhD in theoretical chemistry, it's a very industrial focused PhD. Because in, in the program at Chicago, you had to do three things. You had to develop some analytic theory on your own, something of some, sub, of some substance. You have to write software. You have to code up the theory as an, in software. And you have to run some, you have to collaborate with some experimentalist to show that your theory is useful. And a good PHP program in something like theoretical chemistry would have all of those three elements. And 
it, it turns out theoretical chemistry was always a industrial PhD because you're dealing with large software programs, something like Gaussian or Schrodinger, which are these very, very sophisticated programs that solve the Schrodinger equation. And I mean, these things are like hundreds of thousands of lines long. And you've got to go in there and you've got to get something working inside that code base because no one really is going, or you have to write your own code base. You have to have, in our case at Chicago, we had a massive code base that we built on this Columbus package that we could use to do quantum mini body theory. And so you have a lot of experience already in software engineering and a lot of experience in how to apply what you're doing. And so it's very important to have those three. I think I think a lot of people, when they maybe do their thesis work, you know, maybe they're they're doing an academic paper on something, they're looking at, but they don't really apply it to a problem. So they don't really have the experience of how do I take what I've developed, which may be very interesting, you know, theoretically, and apply it to something which people are trying to use. And, and that's a critical thing. And, and in addition, you know, when you work in industry, you've, you've got to code. You've got to know how to code. And so you've got to spend a lot of time. Uh, and I think actually it's much easier now. When I was in grad school, we did everything in Fortran. Fortran and C++, and then you go into the real world, everybody's doing Java. Like, well, what is this? You know, nobody can, you know. <laughs> Uh, Fortran you know. still exists in NumPy. I have a client doing Fortran. We're doing Fortran with them because they have this. It's academic code, and we had to convert it into Python. Mm -hmm. No, Fortran is very fast. It's very powerful. Python actually came out. I remember when I was a postdoc. Python came out. Yeah. And we were looking at it. What is this? This is nice. It kind of wrapped Fortran. You could do all these really great things. Now I think you could do everything in Python. I think the big challenge is, is moving from what is an academic code base, which is you're kind of hacking something together and getting it to work, moving to a production environment where you really have to have code that other people can use that can be deployed automatically. You have DevOps, you have, you, you have testing. And, you know, if, if you're involved in, say, putting together an open source package and you're giving it to the world, then you, you see a lot of that. We did a lot of that when I was in graduate school. We, we, we built a large... You know, we use source control and we have test systems and automated deployments. Uh, if you're not used to that kind of environment, then it's it, it's a bit of a challenge to move into an environment which is with the software engineering is much more structured. For sure, for sure. Imagine a hypothetical fourth year astronomy PhD student who has one more year maybe in their PhD program before uh, they're confident that they want to leave academia and go into private industry. Uh, maybe they have some MATLAB experience from their research, but as that fourth year astronomy PhD student, how, what, what advice would you give them to optimize for income and interesting job coming out of their astronomy PhD program? If they, I, I, I think the hardest thing in coming out of a PhD program and moving to industry certainly where I, I get a lot of pain working with young PhDs, is that you're not used to working with other people in a team environment. When you go work at a small company, especially if you work at a small company, like a startup, it's a team. You've got to be able to play with everyone else. You've got to work within their environment. We had I worked on a project once, and the guy did all his work in Mathematica. Mm -hmm. He'd be kidding me. But, you know, I would never give Mathematica to a client. What would they do with it? You know, I mean, nobody understands what it does. And, you know, people have to understand what you're doing. Otherwise, your work just gets buried. Just like your work would get buried in the literature. Nobody ever reads your papers. Mm -hmm. If you write it in some obscure code, you know, no one else will be able to use it. And it creates just a tremendous, um, uh, it, 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 it creates a problem for people to integrate. You're, you're going to be working independently, but you have to be able to work with other people and understand what that environment is and be transparent and open about what you're doing. And, and other people have to be able to use what you're doing. Frequently, you know, like we had clients come to us, for example, say, well, we've written all this code in R and the data scientists did everything in R. We want to put it in production in Hadoop. And I look and I go, what are you talking to me for? Go talk to your Hadoop vendor. What, what do you want me to do? You know, write a write a package in R for Hadoop. You know, I mean, you you know, it's not. Why why did you do this? You know, I mean, why do you have people working in R and production guys working in Hadoop? I mean, how are you gonna? And so this is very common, and it's a real problem in the industry because you have so many different technologies being developed. But I mean, the only the best way to work in the industry is to just go and do it. So for somebody in a PhD program that might be cloistered away from industry. 
What are the popular tools? I mean, they're, they're basically three tools people use. You're going to have IPython running in Python. You're going to be doing Scala, you know, Databricks-style notebooks and Scala on the Spark. JVM-based language. Right. Yeah. Or you're going to be doing R. I, mean, I think the other thing people are really interested in is TensorFlow and deep learning. And, you know, that you can do in Python. It's mostly Python interface. It's quite good. Mm -hmm. Um and, and those kinds of projects are really less about production coding and more about understanding how to use the tools. You know, how do you use all these different tools that exist, uh, either in R or that are in scikit-learn, or, you know, what do you do in Scala to make it work? Mm -hmm. And th those are the three primary products I see right now in production, you know, this year. For sure. So this is kind of a totally different dimension than what skills are valued right now and what should people be learning, but we're in San Francisco right now. Um, I think one of the questions that people are curious about is, if you're familiar with it, what is the difference in different geographical job markets? Just limiting to the United States, let's say, what's the difference between San Francisco and Boston? This is the most competitive environment in the world, mm -hmm. and it's pretty brutal. But at the same time, uh, it's where you're going to hone your skills the best. I remember when I came out to California, and people said to me, why are you going to California? I'm, I'm going to get involved in this technology stuff. I go, and they're just like, don't go out there. You don't know what you're going to do. You know, It was just like they were so negative. And I'm like, come on, guys. you know, <laughs> you got to take some chances. This is where all the action is. Yeah, If you're, if you're somewhere else, sure. You know, you're going to have to go and find those people, and you've got to get into that social click where you can be around enough people so you're constantly being pushed. Mm -hmm. Not only are you pushing yourself, but everybody around you is pushing you. Well, thanks for spending the time, Charles. Hey, thank you. I really appreciate it. I hope, uh, uh, you know, if people have questions, you know, um, you know, post them. I assume we'll be online somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah. If you, like Charles says, if you guys have questions for Charles, just post on the YouTube channel or whatever website you're viewing this from and uh, perhaps we'll regroup in a few months and do a, another video. Sounds great. Thanks again, Max. Thanks, All guys. right. Thank you. Appreciate it.